Hey, Congregation of the Mighty. Good morning, good morning. I tell you what, I think that's the first time I've seen that intro. We have a cool intro. We we cool. We doing it. Yeah, that's nice. I like that. You know, and I was just, we were just talking about, you know, that's what happens when like you're here, you know, in service all the time. You don't get to see all the cool stuff online. So yes, yes and amen. All right. So this morning we are going to talk about the biotics of the dunamite. We're going to talk about like what is uh, biotics, kind of get into the meaning um, that, like I said, that she has discussed before. We're going to dive into that and basically, you know, what are the building blocks of the bionic, what what makes up those building blocks for the dunamite, uh, as well as how that relates to the soul and how our, our own makeup, our own physical makeup simply represents what's happening in our soul and how that affects how we are constructed as God's dudamite. So we're going to get into it. It's going to be fun, I promise. So we're talking about exerting God's power and exercising his dudamus. All right. So becoming God's dudamite, and I know we had discussed a little bit uh, about this last week, but just to a review. So we're talking about assuming our role, like what it means to become God's dudamite. So that is assuming our role, taking our place, taking the reins. And we discussed what some of that was last week. So taking the reins, taking control, taking control of what's going on in your spirit, in your soul, in your own life, as well as taking the reins of what God has put in your sphere, what God has put in your sphere of influence. So, and also exercising our elect offspring authority. So again, too, not relying on our own will, not relying on our own works, not even relying on our own words, but in everything, doing it through our mantle, doing it through our call, doing it through what God has dispensed within us. Again, too, with that understanding of everything that we need has already been put in us. Everything that we need in this life, every faculty, every tool, every strength, every bit uh, of our intelligence, every bit of bravery, courage, all of it, every talent that we need was already put in us, was already put on our souls. It was already engrafted, encoded, not only in our very DNA, but in the encoding of our soul in the engrafting of our spirit. So a lot of times that working through that becoming a dunamite is going in and letting the Holy Spirit, as well as engaging with your spirit, express through your soul, let your soul's DNA and your soul's genotyping and phenotyping be allocated to the Holy Spirit, to the Godhead. And with that conversion of the soul, it gets expressed through your mind, through your emotions, through your thoughts, through your words. Because remember, we talked about it. We went through all those words, what those words meant, how words relate to thought and the heart and the soul. And we're, so we're going to, we're going to get all in it. Amen. So it's going to be fun. All right. So biotic, what does biotic mean? What, what are we talking about when we say biotic? You know, we, we think we're like, oh, I mean, like, bio, I mean, like, biology, life, what? So what, what, what exactly are we talking about? So biotic. Biotic is relating to or resulting from living things, especially in their e- ecological relations. So think about that for a minute. So the biotics of the dudamite. So your dudamite nature is related to. So the biotics of your dudamite is related to or resulting from the living, the living things that orchestrate, that encompass your spirit, your soul as a dudamite. Especially, like I said, in your sphere of influence that God has given you. Biotic can also mean life. So the life of the dudamite, which means the conditioning, the conditioning of living organisms. So your dunamite lifestyle, your dunamite soul is to be that conditioning of life for you as a living creature. 
Dudamite biology. So the, the biology of being a Dudamite, which is the study of life. What brings you life? What brings life into you? What activates you as a Dudamite? So we're talking about biotic material. So the Dudamite material, which is derived from living things. So you pulling from the Holy Spirit, either through worship or prayer or whatnot. So biotic composition. So the biotic um, components. So what makes you, what are the literal components that make you a Dunamite? So think about that. Just you, you know, yes, we all have the Holy Spirit. We've got prayer. We've got the word. We've got, but what specifically in you, in your life, what are the components in your life? What are the bi biotics, the dunamite biotics? What are the compositions, the living compositions in you that make you a dunamite? And what does that entail? We're going to get into that. Uh, so biotic potential. So that's an organism's reproductive capacity. So we know what that means on biology. That means, you know, the ability to reproduce. So are you able to reproduce God's dunamis power? Are you able to produce the dunamite lifestyle, not just in yourself, but in others? Through your words, through your works, through your ministry, through your call, through your anointing, through your charisma, through whatever God has given you. So think about that. I mean, uh, not, not just your kids. Okay, I know you'll be like, well, my kids, they do what I say. You know, we're not, we're not just talking about kids. I, I know that that'd be easy to, you know, like, hey, well, my, my kids read the Bible because you're reading it to them. Yes, I understand. Okay, <laughs> I, I get it. But we're talking about some like your coworkers, your relatives. Sometimes relatives can be the hardest. Ooh, they can be the hardest. But think about it. So even with some of you that have come here, who have changed your lives uh, to come here and be a part of this work and this calm, how has that reflected in the lives of your family? And I can testify for some of that family change, it can take years. But it's years of faithfulness. And it's years of commitment. It's years of unflinching. It's, it's years of grit to where they see, oh, oh, you're serious about this. Oh, okay. All right. This is literally who you are. See, if there's still a question of if this is you, then that dunamite power isn't being expressed. If there's still a question of, is this really real? Or when times get hard, are you going to come back home? See that? That in and of itself. Or hey, like the young man that Jesus talked to, when, you're, when there is death in your family, when things happen in your family that you have to run to, okay, what did Jesus say to that young, young rich ruler? Give all that you have to the poor and come follow me. You ever notice that? Like Jesus never said, no, you're not worthy. You're not one of the original 12 that I've called. He didn't say that at all. He said, okay, you want me? You need to give up all of these things that are in your heart and come follow me. Because those were treasures of his heart that he wasn't wanting to give up, that he wasn't wanting to get rid of. What are some of the treasures in your heart that are keeping you from being engrafted, from becoming the dunamite? What are some of the things that you would might say, oh, that may not be a biotic of the dunamite life. That may be more tied to ooh, my fleshly desires the things that I want for my life. And I tell you, like I said, the components, the components of reproductibility. There's a lot of things that go into reproduction, especially in today's day and age. It is not as easy as it once was for many individuals. So but think about it. Is your composition compatible with reproducing 
the Deutamite lifestyle so that it can not only be seen in you, but that you are receptible, receptacle or are a receptacle of God's reproduction. See, a lot of that we have to look back and see, we have to look back and see at our, what are our works? What are our works saying about us? You know, for some of us, there's just like, well, I haven't done anything bad. I mean, like my track record is clean, but you haven't left an impression. There's no impression that's been made by you. Those, there's no impartation of power. There's no impartation of life. You haven't impacted anybody. You may have put amazing binders together. And don't get me wrong, binders are important. Don't get me wrong. You know, there are some people in this world that are, they change the world a binder at a time. Trust me, binders are important. I'm just simply saying, I'm not, I'm not saying binders aren't important. My God, we need them. Protocol, procedure, all of that. Hey, you can change the world a binder at a time. I'm not saying that. But I'm simply saying, okay, are you just doing busy work and not making an impact in the kingdom? Because there should be some expression like I said, once, I mean, we're, yes, we are all, we are always developing. We are always, you know, perfecting ourselves in the faith. But I'm simply saying outside of that, and again, outside of your kids, your kids got to listen to you. They don't really have a choice. You know, outside of Bebe. Okay, so who are the individuals that you impact? And you know how you always know? People that you impact always remember you. E even regardless of what's going on, they always remember you. They always remember your important moments. They're always there to celebrate you in your important moments. They they are oh, because you have been you are not only just there for them, but you were that person that God could use in that moment that brought change into their lives. What change are you bringing forth? Whether, like I said, whether it's the youth, whether it's just taking someone out for coffee, it doesn't have to be some magical display, not magical. It doesn't have to be like some like profound, majestic display on stage. Who are you impacting? What impact are you leaving? Okay, when people, you know, get done with a conversation with you, are they depressed? Are they, <laughs> do they feel they need to recover? after they've had a conversation with you? Or are they uplifted? Are they encouraged? How, are they walking away with a piece of revelation, truth, knowledge that they didn't know before? That's the biotics of the dunamite. It's not just intake. You know, for so long, you know, and again, it's just kind of the trend of how the church is going right now that we have to shake ourselves out of. Because how, I mean, how many of you can testify? I mean, like the, the main propaganda, I don't want to say propaganda, but it is kind of propaganda. Of just the whole kind of trend of the church is just like every sermon that comes from the pulpit is some self-help mumbo jumbo. That it's like, it's all on God. It, you know, we just need to pray. I and mean, prayer is important. Don't get me wrong. Prayer is important. But it's got to go beyond the prayer closet to make any difference. Because God's not just going to drop it from heaven. He already dropped you from heaven. Okay? He already dropped your spirit. He already died on the cross and had the Holy Spirit hovering. And so the, the Holy, what he has dropped has already dropped, which is the Holy Spirit and the planet which is your spirit that has been gifted to you from God, from eternity. That's all the dropping from heaven that's happening. The rest is on us. The responsibility of the planet, the responsibilities of government, the responsibilities of education, the responsibilities of health and wellness and wholeness. Guys, it, it, the responsibility of the kingdom is on us. And so we've got to get beyond just this intake mode of just, well, I mean, does it, how does it make me feel? 
Some of the best correction is not meant to make you feel good. Some of the best correction in the planet will bruise your ego to such a point that you feel crushed enough to what? Change. This is why God says, I chasten who I love. God's chastening, the trials and tribulations he puts us through, that is for a reason. And it is because he loves us. Why? Because he knows what's in us. And he knows what's in the planet. Remember, he said, woe to the earth, because Satan's been cast down to you. I did my part. I kicked him out of heaven. Now it's your part. It's supposed to be our responsibility to kick him out of the earth. But see, if we are so stuck on my personal Jesus, if we are so stuck on, well, my best life now, then think about think about it. What impact, what are you changing in government? What are you changing in the kingdom? What change is happening beyond you? So if anything, just to think about that, just to stop and just write that question down. Just stop and write it, write it down. What change is happening outside of me in my personal life? What programs have I implemented? What great ideas has have I come up with through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that have been put into action? Whose lives have I changed? Because see, now it's this whole trend of Christianity that again, is just self-indulgence. That's really what it is. We, we can't call it anything else. We just can't because it is what it is. It's self-indulgence of how worship makes me feel how I get impacted and how I feel about that song and how my, you know, expression of worship or, you know, my style of worship, we've totally gotten away from how worship, is, <laughs> worship, <laughs> worship is to be about God. It's about to be laying yourself out before God, pouring yourself out as a drink offering. It's supposed to be about God, not about us not about how worship makes us feel. Now, yes, absolutely. Can there be healing, deliverance? Can God speak to you to your, during worship? Yes, absolutely. But that is after you get to the place where you've already given the Holy Spirit and the Godhead and, and Jesus Christ and the Father all of the praise and the glory and the honor and the exaltation. And remember, even for for the you know in ancient times with the with the levites the sacrifice the sacrifices came first and then came worship you're supposed to put yourself down as a burnt offering and then the glory showed up so we've got to get beyond this whole this whole trend, this whole, this whole just me, myself, and I Christianity. And we've got to get beyond just intake. You know, there, there's a reason why in scripture he talks about fat pigs. Because what pigs, pigs just eat. You ever think about, you ever seen pigs? You ever seen pigs in a zoo or at a petting zoo? Do, do they, you know, work out? Do they go and help the chickens? Do they, do they go? And they don't, they're not even like goats. They don't even clear a field. You know, you can put a, a, a herd of goats out to pasture and they'll mow your lawn for you because they'll eat everything. Pigs, you know what pigs do? Pigs eat whatever is in front of them. There is a reason why they were classified as an unclean animal. Pigs just eat whatever's in front of them. They don't ask why. They don't even bother to digest it. They just, they can see whatever slop. That's why you gave them slop. You could literally just give them the leftovers. You can give them whatever because they would just eat everything. And so many times we just eat what's put in front of us and we don't even ask why. We don't even go and find where that is in scripture. We don't even stop and be like, okay, wait a minute. Like one of the things we're going to talk about today. Okay, everything, everything starts with words. Our very biotics, our very DNA starts with words. 
Well, wait, 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 wait. Like DNA is molecules. DNA is, you know, nucleic acids and, and nucleotide bases. Like, how is that words? We're going to go through that and look. But again, that's like taking the principles that God has and walking it out further. Like I said, not just taking a back seat on your own Christianity. We need to stop taking a back seat to our own lives. And we need to stop taking a back seat to this revelation. We need to start taking it apart and digesting it. You know, one of the key facets of a good diet is actually chewing. So many of us through either just, you know, regardless of what we eat, you could eat some of the healthiest things, but if you do not properly digest it, if you don't break it down to enough smaller pieces and then choose to put it in your mouth and choose to chew it, break it down enough to where it can be properly ingested, it can, pro can be properly absorbed by your stomach and by your intestines, you can have the healthiest diet ever, but if you're not eating properly, it's not being properly digested. It's not being properly taken up. You know, for some of us, we take this word and then we take this wisdom and we just like swallow it whole. And you don't take the time to break it down. We don't take the time to ask questions. So again, that's part of the, our bionic responsibility and how, to, how we become not just Dr. Price, not just the leaders, but how we become Deutamites is breaking this down for ourselves. Okay, so also bionic community. What is the bionic community of the Deutamites? So the bionic community, it involves all the interactions, all the interactions, all the interacting organisms living together in a specific habitat. So I tell you what, what defines us is our call to be the elect. What defines us is what are the congregation of the mighty, where God stands. Have any of you guys ever thought about that? About what that scripture actually means? So let's take it back. Let's put it in context. Because I know we as Americans, you know, we we weren't, we were taken from a monarchy. You know, we've never had a king or a queen and we, we don't really rest on all that protocol and, you know, pomp and circumstance and all that. So if you think about it, so this is what that, that scripture is actually entailing. So uh, when you were in the king's presence or the, when the king held his court and the king would come and, you know, of course, when the king comes in, everyone stands. Everyone stands out of what? Acknowledgement of the royalty that is in their presence. So they would typically stand and then sometimes they would kneel before he would sit down or he or she would, you know, would sit down. But it was the acknowledgement that they were in the presence of royalty because what? The throne was just a chair until the presence of the king or queen had come, had entered in. So think about that. A congregation is just a congregation. A building is just a building without the presence of the king. So the, the, you know, it became a chair transferred into a throne when the king entered in. And so when the king enters in, he sits. And then he sits and he's about to do business. And so, you know, a lot of times that involved different sovereignties, uh, royalties from other countries. And so when you wanted to assert dominance and say, uh, say the Queen of England, uh, and she was seeing some of her subjects that were for, from Australia. Well, she is the queen over that area. So when the sovereignties or even representatives or servants of Australia would come in, she would not stand because they are under her. The queen doesn't stand because she registers as them under her. Now say, and again, I'm thinking just back in ancient times, say if the queen of England, say Queen Elizabeth, was at her throne seeing individuals and the king of Spain was coming on official business. That 
is an equal sovereignty. And that in which when he comes in, she would stand. Because she is registering a royalty that is unto her and very much like her. And so in that, they would kneel and she would sit and they would conduct business. So I want you to think about that. Being the congregation of the mighty. So think of like when all the other churches and all the other people of God come in, Jesus Christ is sitting. But God stands in the congregation of the mighty and he rules among the gods. This is why we are called to be different. Because in our presence, King Jesus stands. He registers us as one of his own. So that, and this again, that's what that scripture is, is referencing to. And like I said, so many times as Americans, we can kind of skip over those because we don't realize the protocol and everything that goes into that. Plus, too, like I said, in, in those ancient times, when you wanted to really make sure that a certain sovereignty knew that you weren't putting up with their shenanigans, they would come in and they would stand, and that reigning queen, or king or queen would not stand. And she would make them put whatever, you know, she would typically signal that they had to kneel or either on whatever they were carried in on had to be put down because she wasn't standing. So neither could they, they had to be lower than her. So again, thinking about that royalty and thinking about that royal protocol. So think about that. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He doesn't stay seated. That is a higher, and uh, that is a calling that is, uh, not like a lot of the other churches. And this is why the demand is put on us to be the example for the kingdom, to be part of the ruling body of the kingdom of heaven. So just talking about that bionic community that we're a part of. So in two, bionic energy. And this is a uh, vital force theorized by the biochemist Benjamin Moore. We'll get into that later. All right. So again, excuse me. So the building box of organic biotics, of the organic biotic, the bi bi building, I'm sorry, building the organic bionic you brick by brick. So she had given this slide, I mean, it didn't look like this, but she had given this slide quite a while ago. I want to say it was a year or so ago, but she laid out, so what are the building, what are the building materials, excuse me, of what the dunamite should be composed of? This is quite a list, and this is only some of them. So we have purpose, force, love, faith, prayer, Peace, wisdom, grit, hope, trust, grace, passion, boldness, holiness, service, fidelity. It's a word you don't hear very much. Conviction, bravery, loyalty, resolve, determination. So you can see just from what we talked about, just being a congregation of the mighty, that's going to take some grit. That's going to take some determination. Why? Because you're called to be the elect. You're not just called to be part of like just the general body of Christ. We are a part of that ruling body of the kingdom. Per, I mean, I mean that, that's just a short list of everything that she listed. So again, so these are the building blocks of what should be the composition of the dunamite. So now we're going to relate this. We're going to kind of relate this back to DNA. And so we know, you know, that there's, there's certain building blocks of, that make up DNA and that DNA is the material that makes up literally who we are. It makes us unique all unto ourselves, the only one on the planet. 
These are the components, these are the building blocks that make you an organic biotic dunamite. So what's not listed in there, what's not listed in there is fear, intimidation, anger, rage, self-loathing, depression, self-sabotage, bitterness, unforgiveness. Yeah, you see, none, none of those are in there. Huh. So those things might, those are components that might be a little counterintuitive to our soul's DNA consisting of a dunamite. So I want you to think, these are all the things that your soul, that your spirit and soul should consist of to be the expression of the dunamite. These are the building blocks. Just like DNA is the building blocks of our, our cells, our organs, our eye color, everything that we are. These are the building blocks of what God is it's supposed to be represented in us that God registers as a dunamite. And so one of the things that she mentioned, like I said, she talked about it all starts with words. Now, I know last week we went through that video and we saw the power of words. That words have a power and a frequency beyond, thank you, beyond just their utterance. So we, you know, we like, we, we like to think, I was like, well, I mean, like, yeah, like words have power because human beings have feelings. Plants don't have feelings. Not like that. Plants don't have a language. Okay, you can talk to your plants, but they ain't going to talk back to you. And if they do, you might want to get checked. <laughs> you, may, you, may, you may need to be evaluated if your plants are talking back to you. But think about that. It all starts with words. I said, and based on that video, based on that experiment, remember that the experiment with the plants. So what, I mean, in same conditions, they had the same source of oxygen or carbon dioxide. They had the same soil composition. They got the same amount of sunlight, everything. It was experiment. Everything was the same. And it's just one was put on a recording and this was a recording. This didn't even happen like in real life. Like, it wasn't, like, in the moment where, like, you know, students were, like, spitting on the plants or something. So this was just a recording of them saying positive things over this plant and the other one saying negative, very negative, bullying things to this plant. And that plant that was being bullied literally was withering away. Now they got the same amount of nutrients, water, the whole thing. So we know plants have power and they have an impact they have an impact beyond just their utterance. And it's not just, you know, how it makes us feel or how our, it infects our mind or our mental capacity. It affects our very cells because that's what that experiment showed. Now, cells are a very basic uh, single cell organism. You know, our cells are circular in shape and theirs are square or rectangular and you know, there's similarities and not, but think about that. So on a very simple cell organism, like a plant, has no language, has no feelings, has, I mean, there, there's not like psychological disorders that are associated with the plant. Think about that. So there's no like psychology, there's no higher level of thinking or processing when it comes to a plant. But that's the effect that words had on something like that. Words that were just spoken, a language that was just spoken. So there's something beyond just the utterance of words that is gets imparted. And we know this even from Scripture. Again, we talked about Luke 6, uh, 45. A good man out of the good treasure, out of the good treasure, so the, the storing up, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure Again, we're talking about the soul, even to the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance, remember we talked about the overflow, out of the abundance of the heart, 
his mouth speaks. So we know the soul is that translucent matter. It's that translucent medium between the spirit and the flesh. And here's the thing about the soul. It gets impacted by both. You know, chemicals, uh, hormones, thoughts, words, all of that, everything that comes into our ear gate, eye gate, all of that, that gets goes through the body to the soul, as well as things that get downloaded and imparted from the spirit also push up against the soul. But it is the soul that involves the mind, the thought, the psyche, the heart, like it talks about in scripture, it is your soul that is the deciding factor. So think about that. And that's why the conversion of the soul is so important. The work that was done on the cross, that was made final in the spirit. That was made final, eternal in the spirit. Remember, your spirits were held up in eternity. They were kept safe in eternity. They were kept pure in eternity. The blood of Jesus released them. And when the impartate, that, that point of being born again. So you think about that. So we know when a person is born in the flesh, they have half of mom's DNA, half of dad's DNA, and the combination of the two makes up that individual. Well, we know too from genetics, so it is what pertains to the actual expression of those genes of whether something is dominant or recessive. And that depends on the coding, the coding of that, that DNA. So again, so if you have, if like say for length of legs, how tall you're gonna be, uh, or like how long your appendages are going to be, you know, say the coding for that, you know, dad has dominant genes for that. Mom has recessive genes for that. Well, okay. Whatever the dominant, the coding of the dominant genes are, that's what is going to actually come into play because the recessive genes compared to dominant genes don't get expressed. Does that kind of make sense? So if you've got recessive genes, and the same set of genes that are for, like, that are code for the same thing, say length of your arms, is dominant. It is the dominant that's actually going to win out in that coding process. So say, but too, like you have, say, for eye color. Say for eye color, you have recessive and recessive. So what that looks like is, say, dad has coding for blue eyes. So, and that's a recessive gene because blue eyes is actually just really the absence of color, is really the absence of any coding of color. And mom too has coding for recessive genes, which would be blue eyes. Well, the baby is born and guess what? You have got recessive, recessive. What's gonna come out is recessive, meaning the child has blue eyes. Now, if you have some combination of recessive and dominant, well, then typically, it, you know, depending on the coding, and you know, I say what will be expressed will usually be the dominant, which means a dominant uh, as far as genetic coding is brown eyes or, or the pigment of color is dominant. So, and that's why too, like you can have all these kids, you have all these kids that have blue eyes. But if that particular coding lines up to where there is dominant now and recessive, the dominant is what will be expressed. And the reason I'm saying that is, so when it comes to the soul, when it comes to the encoding of your soul, you can have good treasure. But if the coding of that is recessive and the evil treasure in your soul or in your heart is what is dominant, Guess what's being expressed? Guess what's coming out of the abundance of your mouth? The evil. Because that is what is being encoded in your soul. That is what is encoded in your heart. This is why he says, renew yourself daily. This is why he says, pray without ceasing. This is why he says, meditate on my word day and night. Because what do we also know? about uh, about words because he says out of as a man thinks in his heart 
so is he. So again, that lays into what is engrafted, what is encoded in the soul. That's what you are. But the coding of the soul can be changed. And again, that is the process of the new birth. Now, with the new birth, you get your spirit. But the process of deliverance is the determination of dominant and recessive coding of the soul. Does that make sense? Awesome. Yes. Okay. So even in Proverbs and Proverbs 6, 2, you are snatched by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So, and again, and I know we talked a lot about that last time, but that just goes to show why, why are you taken? Why are you snatched by the words of your mouth? Because the words of your mouth are an overflow an overflow, meaning what's actually encoded in your soul goes down deep. That's dominant. So we have to see the words, the attitudes. And again, like I said, how a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So this not only is just the words, but where does it start? It starts in the thoughts first. So some of you, hey, you, you, may be, you may be clean cut. You may be doing it. You may be like, hey, I know when to shut my mouth. But what you're exuding, you're expressing. There's like, there, there's no denial that you are upset about something. It may not be coming out of your mouth. You know, not, I unfortunately am one of the, <laughs> I'm one of those fair individuals to where if I, I may not say anything. I mean, you may look at me and I am cool as a cucumber. I got a straight face. Eyes are gentle. I mean, everything, bam, I'm fine. But guess what? If I am mad or I'm embarrassed about something, you know, the one thing I can't control, I get flush. And I know it because literally from my face down to my neck, I feel it get red. There is a flush that goes over me. I know I cannot hide the fact that I am either super embarrassed or I am either really mad. And I can, even though I haven't said anything, I haven't, I, like I said, cool as a cucumber. If you look at my appearance, I am totally fine. And I haven't said anything, so you can't hold it against me. I haven't said a single thing. But my face and my neck, and it's flush. It's the same way in the spirit. Okay, you cannot hide the fact that even from the Holy Spirit, when you get ticked off at God about something that has happened that you don't understand, or, you know, some leader you feel as messed over, what have you, whatever situation, you may not say it, but you are thinking it. And your spirit and soul are expressing it. So you can't hide. And again, that's like, and that goes back into, again, so the words coming out of your mouth are not just an indication, but they are a flashing red light of what is encoded in your soul. So, okay, we're talking about like, it, it's all about words. How is it about words? How is the building box about words? So here we have just a regular, a regular strain of DNA. And I know I'm gonna go a little sciencey on you, but it's okay, you'll be fine. So we've got a regular strand of DNA and you can, I don't, it's a little small, but I don't know if you can see. So one strand goes from Mark five to Mark three, and that's just how the DNA sequence is marked. And then we've got another strand that pairs with it that goes from three to five. Now notice the nucleotides, uh, the nucleus bases that are paired with it. A, T, T, A, C, G, G, C. What does that mean? That is to represent thiamine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Those are the nucleotides. Those are the building blocks that make up DNA. So think about it. If we were to do this for your soul, and especially for the soul of a Dudamite, all the things that we talked about, those building blocks, all of those building blocks, that's what your uh, Dudamite DNA 
should be composed of. Those are the building blocks. So like nucleotides are for DNA. These are the building blocks for your deutamide DNA. And how is that that is composed of words? Notice we didn't number them. So I remember, I remember, so like when Dr. Price first came out with this, I was, uh, I was still in my undergraduate program at ORU, and I think I was either taking biochemistry or genetics. It was one of the two, and it was like this prime moment. And I remember she said it, everything, everything about us is composed of words. Our thoughts, our very makeup, our cells, everything is composed of words. And I was like, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I said, now, Lord, help me understand because our cells are like everything is composed of DNA. It's not like words per se. And he was like, okay, well, stop, stop, hold on, wait a minute. He was like, what makes up DNA? And I was like, well, thiamine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. He was like, okay, well, you notice we didn't number those. Those are words, those are letters. And in fact, how we indicate the pairing the pairing of those bases is by letters, not by numbers. And I seriously had to take a step back and be like, man, so that's what you mean when you say that. Like literally, physically, our makeup is made up of words. Now, yes, they're, you know, they're nucleotides. Like I said, they're chemical compounds, they're molecules, but those molecules consist of names letters, words. Our very DNA is words. It's not numbers. We didn't number those. We gave them letters. And because those letters represent words, and those words represent those molecules. That's also how it is for the DNA typing, the DNA sequencing of your soul. The DNA sequencing of your soul for the deutamide is consistent of not just the words, but what we say also, what we just went through in scripture, the thoughts, the intents of the heart. Those are the things that are encoding your soul. But the blessed thing is, it's also the soul that, it, that comprises the will, the deciding factor. So there's changes that can be made. So let's go on. Let's look at this. So here we see, we know that DNA is a double helix, meaning there's actually two pieces of DNA that are wrapped around each other and they coil up together because they need to coil up together because they compose chromosomes. Now, if you think about it, I'll go back. So a chromosome is actually two alleles. So if you think about, so if you see like, so if you think of two alleles, that's all that DNA, all that DNA wrapped up, wrapped up, wrapped up, wrapped up, wrapped up, super tight. And you've got two alleles that are pinched together in the middle. That makes up a chromosome. So think about it. One chromosome has all of that DNA. This is why soul deliverance can be such a struggle. Because you have to get back to that piece of RNA, that piece of single strand DNA, where those words were encoded on your soul. So that's a lot that, what do we, we, let's unpack that. Let's unpack that. You hear that a lot. Let's unpack that. Because God forbid we say, hey, let's explain something. Because we, we don't want to offend anybody. Look, explain it to me, okay? Look. So here, if you think about it, so those two chromosomes are two alleles that are all super, 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 super coiled up with DNA. So if you were to separate those two chromosomes and just take an allele, take that one strand and unravel it, you get DNA. But then how do we get this DNA to open up and uncoil? Because what? It has to get to RNA. It has to get to that single strand to be able to code. And by coding, we mean reproduce. So what causes the coding of your soul to open up to where either sin or the Holy Spirit can start to write the code of your soul? 
And with that, guys, we got to stop. We'll have to get through it with some of those questions. Hey, what, all those other questions, all that stuff, we will get into it. But we're going to have to answer next time. All right. Hallelujah, God, I bless you. I thank you. I praise you for this wonderful, mighty, yes, God, the elect of the kingdom that you are truly crafting within us. God, I'm asking even now that your spirit of revelation, truth, enlightenment begin to pour over your people now in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that you are taking lethargy. You are taking procrastination. You are taking, yes, God, the lethargic spirit off of the minds and the hearts and the souls of your people, God. God, I thank you that the spirit of challenge of being the Dunamite, of digging into your word would truly come upon them now in Jesus' name. I'm asking God now that you enlighten, that you light them up, God, with the hunger for your word, the hunger for your righteousness, the hunger for your truth, the hunger, God, for change and to become the change, God, not just in their, for themselves, God, but in their churches and their communities for the lost and the righteous. We declare 